rydym wedi parhau i gyhoeddi cymorth ariannol, i cefnogi unigolion ac i helpu gwasanaethau i ymateb i'r argyfwm. Rydym yn dal ati i gydweithio'n agos gyda phadneriaid yn llywodraeth leol a gwasanaeth iechyd a'r holl wasanaethau gyhoeddus eraill i sicrhau bod pob cymorth angen reidiol mewn lle. Rydym yn ddiolchar iawn i bobl Cymru am ddilyn y cyngor pwysig i ymddiffyn iechyd pawb. Rydym hefyd yn dechrau cynllunio am y dyfodol pan fyddwn yn dod allan o'r sefyllfa presennol. Fyddwn yn edrych yn o falus ar y dystiolaeth cyn gwneud unrhyw newidiadau. Fyddwn yn tynnu mewn syniadau newydd i helpu ni gyda'r gwaith pwysig yma. Llywydd coronavirus is both a public health crisis and an economic crisis. The ministers primarily responsible for these two portfolio areas will make statements this afternoon about the actions the Welsh Government is taking in response to the virus. There are very few areas of public life which have not been touched by coronavirus, and this afternoon I will focus on the measures we are taking across other portfolios. As I with many aspects of housing have been affected, from concerns about people with no homes to live in to people travelling into Wales to their second homes. Since the Senate last met, we have provided comprehensive advice about the support available for tenants in Wales, including information about benefits, help with rent, bill payments and debt. We've provided information to landlords and agents in the private rented sector and guidance to local authorities about how they can continue to enforce standards in rented properties to keep people safe. We continue to receive weekly reports from chief constables across Wales on the enforcement of regulations. Let me be clear again, travelling to a second home is not an essential journey and police in Wales are and will stop people attempting to do so. In social care, we have provided an extra £40 million to support adult social care services to meet the increased costs the sector is facing. This funding comes directly from our own budget and is part of the £1.1 billion fighting fund we have created to support public services to respond to coronavirus. I know many members have raised concerns about people who have opted for direct payments and employ their own personal assistance. And since the, last, the Senate last met, we have provided specific information for people in that position. And Social Care Wales has launched a card for all social care workers to help identify them as critical care workers and so access the help and assistance available to them. So with education and childcare have been hugely impacted by the virus. We have issued guidance to critical care workers and parents of vulnerable children about how they can get the help they need in the current circumstances. And we are implementing the extended childcare offer for children of key workers announced by Julie Morgan on the 6th of April. Now, for many young people, this is a time of distress and anxiety. The Education Minister, Kirsty Williams, has announced £1.25 million of additional funding to provide extra mental health support for children, helping, social, helping school counselling services to deal with an anticipated increase in demand. The Minister has also confirmed that A-levels and AS-level results day will be as originally scheduled on the 13th of August and on the 20th of August for GCSEs, the same dates, therefore, as will obtain in both Northern Ireland and England. And yesterday, Llywydd Wales became the first UK nation to confirm additional funding to guarantee free school meals for children during the pandemic. £33 million pounds will be made in additional help to local authorities in this vital area. 
Two weeks ago, Environment Minister Leslie Griffiths answered questions in the Senate. She has continued to meet with industry representatives from Wales' farming, fishing, forestry, environment and food and drink sectors to discuss their specific challenges. A new grant is now available to support fishing businesses cover the fixed costs associated with owning a fishing vessel. And the Welsh Government has launched a bespoke online service to match employers with people looking for work in the agriculture, land or veterinary uh, sectors. That service will help to fill vacancies in the coming months, addressing labour shortages caused by the virus outbreak. Uh, Shall we, I'd like to end by turning to the future. Last Thursday, the four governments of the United Kingdom agreed the current stay-at-home restrictions must continue for at least a further three weeks. Now is not the moment to throw away all the efforts we have made, especially as there are signs of them beginning to bear fruit. But it is really important to stress that the threat from coronavirus is far from over. Sadly, lives will still be lost in the days to come. And I know that all members will want to pause a moment to remember the 600 people and more who are no longer with us and the grief and distress which this continues to cause to those who are closest to them. Now, any decision to ease restrictions will only be made, will only be made when the medical and scientific evidence is clear that the time is right to do so. The process in Wales will be careful, cautious and gradual. There can be no sudden return to the way of life we enjoyed before the pandemic began. And so with when I made my first to the Senate under our new arrangements, we still face the realistic anxiety that coronavirus might accelerate its spread in Wales to the point when our, our NHS could have been overwhelmed. That this has not happened is a tribute to the enormous work which has gone on in such a rapid period to extend the capacity of the service and the efforts which Welsh citizens have made to reduce the circulation of the virus in the community. Today, the number of patients in Welsh hospitals because of coronavirus has stabled and the number of new admissions is falling. Over half our extended critical care capacity is still available. More than 3,000 acute hospital beds are in the same position, and both figures have improved again over the last few days. It is because of that platform which has been created that we can now use the weeks ahead to prepare, to agree a common set of objective measures to identify the point at which it is safe to begin lifting restrictions. These measures will tell us when the time is right to move beyond the current position. There will be a risk that the virus will begin to circulate again. We need to set up strong public health surveillance measures. So if there are local outbreaks, we can identify them quickly and respond effectively. In Wales, we have retained a national public health service with a strong local presence and we must use this as the basis of our response. We must also learn from international experience. There are already countries in Europe and beyond where restrictions are being lifted. We will use the next few weeks to learn from what works and when, what might not work elsewhere in the world. And so finally, we will also use that period to plan for Wales' future beyond coronavirus by drawing in expertise and experience from outside government. We will establish a group of people from inside Wales and beyond to challenge our thinking, to contribute new ideas, and so to help us plan for recovery. We have put our framework for doing so in place, and I look forward to discussing that plan and that path to the future with the Senev in the weeks ahead. Before I call on the Leader of the Opposition, um, just to say that I'm aware that a member wishes to raise a point of order, I'll take all points of order at the end of the statements, so no visual aids are required. Paul Davis. Can I uh, thank the uh, First Minister 
for his statement uh, this afternoon. And can I echo your comments, First Minister, and convey my condolences to those families who have lost loved ones during this pandemic. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to be felt by families, communities and businesses across the country, it is vital that no stone is left unturned in identifying the threat and treating those who have been affected as soon as uh, possible. The Welsh Government's announcement of a rapid review into Wales's testing system is a crucial step forward, not only to see where problems are arising in terms of administering the test, but also in terms of making the process around it far more efficient. And I appreciate that the Health Minister will be making a statement on some of these issues later, but you are, of course, responsible for the overall government strategy. Therefore, can you tell us uh, what initial findings have been made from the Welsh Government's rapid review and what sort of time scales have been put in place to see any new changes to the uh, system? We know that the target of 5,000 tests a day was not met, met by mid-April and it's very clear that nowhere near 9,000 tests will be taking place by the end of this month as originally promised. In fact, we know that on some days, far less than 1,000 tests a day have been carried out. So to be blunt, First Minister, why are so few tests actually taking place? And why has the Welsh Government failed to meet its targets? Because it's important our key frontline workers are tested as quickly as possible in order to keep them uh, safe. It's clear that there is capacity in the system that's just not being used to test key frontline workers and community testing centres and drive-in centres across Wales are still not all fully operating. Therefore, can you tell us when you anticipate the opening of all testing centres for key workers so that we can at least get an idea of when testing will be taking place in all parts of Wales? Now, at the start of this pandemic, I raised the importance of reaching those living and working in social care settings, and you make reference to this in your statement today. And it is regrettable that more hasn't been done earlier to tackle the impact of coronavirus in care homes across Wales. At the time, you said that there was a particular challenge in Wales because the sector is dominated by small owners of one or two residential care homes. And so getting messages out to people is a bigger challenge when you have larger numbers of people involved and people who may not necessarily be as attuned to dealing with demands as large companies who are well set up and equipped to do this. Given that care home residents are at a heightened risk of serious complications from the virus, and we're now seeing more reported cases in care homes, what specific action is the Welsh Government now taking to expedite support for those living and indeed working in the sector? Now, First Minister, the Health Minister made it clear yesterday that securing enough PPE is a bigger priority than the challenges on coronavirus testing. Now, you'll be aware that the Royal College of Nursing in Wales and indeed others are calling on the Welsh Government to commit to safeguarding supplies of PPE as well as calling for the Government not to weaken the guidance to disguise shortages and also to conduct a rapid audit across health boards to ensure that PPE is being distributed effectively to all care settings. It is unacceptable that 74% of nursing staff have raised concerns about PPE and that over half of nursing staff have felt pressured to care for a patient without adequate protection. Therefore, could you confirm what the Welsh Government will, uh, that the Welsh Government will now undertake a rapid audit of PPE across health boards in Wales, as well as confirm what action is being urgently taken to ensure that key workers in Wales all have access to the PPE that they need? Uh, so we thank Paul Davis for those uh, questions. Uh, let me be clear that testing is taking place in all parts of Wales. Uh, over 20,000 tests have been carried out uh, in Wales during the coronavirus crisis. 40% of those tests have been made available to frontline healthcare staff. Uh, there is more that needs to be done to simplify the process from which social care staff in particular can be identified and then offered testing at the different uh, centres uh, that we have. And that's one of the key conclusions of the rapid review that Paul Davis uh, referred to, that we need to simplify that process while still safeguarding uh, essential uh, safety aspects of the system it is really important that the right person does turn up at the right time in the right place for the right test. Uh, and it sounds easier than it is to get all of those things lined up when you have a very scattered population 
uh, all of whom have to be uh, put through a certain level of assurance. But we did hear from the head of the Welsh Local Government Association today, uh, some of us, that some of the immediate steps that have been taken are accelerating their ability to put forward social care staff uh, for testing and that more tests are being done uh, as a result. Uh, the rapid review proposed that we should report weekly on the number of tests available, the number of tests being taken out and the steps that are in place to increase that further week by week. And that's what we will uh, be doing. There will be more tests available by the end of this week than they were at the end of uh, last week. Uh, and I believe that we will have more people taking up those tests as we simplify uh, the referral process. Uh, Paul Davis, uh, so I thought set out very well some of the challenges that there are there in getting information uh, and other uh, aspects to the care home sector, given its nature here uh, in Wales. But we are working closely with Care Forum uh, Wales. Want to uh, again just express my thanks to them for everything they are doing to strengthen their ability to get information to that front line. There is absolutely no suggestion anywhere uh, that we are weakening the guidance. We were part of uh, the rapid review of guidance that the UK government uh, led that has resulted in an extended number of people in the care sector, particularly becoming entitled to PPE. And we are observing and implementing that guidance here uh, in Wales. Uh, as a result of all of that, uh, we will have provided 48 million uh, pieces of PPE from stores here uh, in Wales, 40% of our pandemic store supplies going to social care. Uh, and you know, the struggle uh, we have is to replenish those stocks in a globally competitive market. Uh, we know already where our stocks are and how much we have uh, in reserve. We carry out regular exercises to make sure that we get the most up-to-date reports from across the system about stores that are being held of different items in different parts of Wales. And as we draw down supplies that come into Wales from outside, so we act as quickly as we can to make sure that those stores are dispersed to the different centres from which they are then onwardly transmitted to the 640 GP practices we have in Wales, the 715 pharmacies that we have in Wales, the thousand or so care homes we have in Wales. Uh, members will see that this is a huge logistical exercise uh, and one which uh, is taking an enormous amount uh, of time, effort and commitment from dedicated people working in the health service uh, and in local government right across Wales. Paul Davis. Well, thank you for those uh, responses, uh, First Minister. Now, as you've said in your statement today, whilst the coronavirus pandemic is an enormous global health challenge, it's also a significant economic challenge too. Now, the financial support that has been available to most sectors has been generous, and I'm sure it's greatly received by those recipients. However, there are sectors like farming and tourism which feel left behind because support is either unavailable, inaccessible, or it simply just doesn't cover the needs of those working in those sectors. So given uh, that the, uh, for, uh, the Welsh farming industry is integral to Wales's economy, culture, and indeed identity, what urgent steps is the Welsh Government taking to address the very real crisis faced by Welsh farmers, particularly uh, dairy farmers at this time, in order to protect the sustainability of Welsh farming for the future. And perhaps you could send a clear statement today to Welsh farmers, First Minister, by reinforcing the message that they are also key workers and allowing them to access funding under the Economic Resilience Fund. Now, last week, the Welsh Government restricted the eligibility of those who could claim £10,000 in grant funding within the tourism sector. And whilst I understand that some second homeowners were taking advantage of the Welsh Government's previous flexibility, the revised guidance now means that many genuine small self-catering tourist operators across Wales may no longer be able to access this funding. 
First Minister, will you reconsider the position taken on this specific issue so that small scale self catering tourist operators are able to receive support during this period, given the important role that they play in supporting the Welsh tourist uh, industry? Now, I appreciate that the rate of business applications has been unprecedented. And whilst we all welcome any support packages that are made available uh, in Wales, I think there's some more work needed to fine tune some of the packages on offer. For example, the Welsh fishing industry has told me that the support for them, and you make reference to this in your statement today, doesn't quite cover their costs and that the eligibility for further support needs to be made uh, fairer. Road haulage businesses, which still have to pay business rates, have made it clear that more needs to be done to support the distribution industry, which, as you know, is critical at this time in ensuring vital goods are able to be transported. And finally, tourism businesses are telling me that they feel the seasonality of their business is not being taken into account when designing some of the support schemes in place. And so they're falling between the gaps in accessing support because their business model doesn't quite fit the government's assessment criteria. Therefore, what fine tuning is the Welsh Government doing to better understand the diverse range of businesses in Wales to ensure that each of the government's business support packages are reaching those who actually need it? And finally, can you tell us what support is being made available to those businesses that either aren't fact registered because their turnover isn't that big, are sole traders or are operating small limited companies because it seems as though these kinds of micro businesses have not been considered when designing business support packages? Uh, sorry, the, the leader of the opposition has mentioned uh, dairy farming, fishing, tourism, uh, sole traders, I think there were another uh, in there too. And uh, I think all he is doing is illustrating uh, the astonishing economic challenge that there is as a result of coronavirus. Uh, and all of those haulage, I'm sorry, it was another thing you mentioned, all of those sectors I know uh, are facing real uh, challenges. And we could have added to that list many times uh, over, I'm sure. Uh, the Welsh Government's resources are limited. Uh, we are squeezing everything we can out of uh, our existing budgets. We are passing on every penny of additional help that comes our way through the UK Government, and we are doing our best to design the additional help that we can provide in a way that is complementary to the help that the UK government schemes are offering to businesses here uh, in Wales. Um, I'm, of course, very uh, happy to put on record our recognition of everything that is being done by the farming community uh, here in Wales, uh, to recognise the particular challenges that dairy farmers uh, are facing. Uh, Leslie Griffiths welcomed on Friday of last week the temporary lifting of some competition laws in the dairy industry to allow for um, a more planned way in which the milk that is being produced in the dairy industry can be used uh, for places where milk uh, is needed. In the meantime, we've produced guidance for dairy farmers in Wales, helping them to make sure that if as a last resort they have to uh, um, dispense with the milk that they have without it going into the food chain, that they can do that in the safest way uh, possible. As for the changes we have made to uh, self-catering accommodation, um, I'm perfectly happy to say that we keep it under review because it was a review of the evidence that led to Julie James announcing the changes that we have made. And what the changes mean is, is that a tourist uh, business, even a small scale one, has to demonstrate that it is letting property for 140 days uh, in a year. And I, I really don't think that if that is the income that you are depending upon, that it is unreasonable for you to show that 140 days of the year, uh, that property is being occupied uh, for tourism uh, purposes. And then you have to demonstrate that the income you get represents a reasonable proportion of your total income. The anxiety was, uh, and I know Paul Davis will know this because it's been raised by local authorities in southwest and northwest uh, Wales, was that a lot of public money was at risk of going into uh, the pockets of people 
for whom this is a small and supplementary part of their income, not the income that they rely on to make their business uh, a success. So I think we have done the right thing, but I'm very uh, happy to say that we will keep the evidence under review. And if fine tuning is required, uh, then we will uh, return uh, to that. And that is true of a number of the other uh, things that Paul Davis uh, mentioned, the uh, fishing industry, for example. We've announced uh, a scheme to make sure we can assist our fishing uh, industry in Wales. If it needs to be fine-tuned, we'll need the evidence and we will look uh, at that. I'm very alert to the points that uh, the leader of uh, the opposition made about tourism in Wales. I know we've rehearsed it here before that the pattern in the tourism industry is that people invest in the winter and recoup those costs and make their businesses successful in the summer. And as the weeks go by, that is putting a very uh, particular strain on that business uh, model. We are working hard alongside tourism industry to try to do what we can to help. On micro businesses and the other points that Paul Davis ended with, in many ways those are uh, gaps in the UK government's uh, scheme. And they have the major responsibilities uh, here. And we continue to engage with UK ministers. Uh, and you know the Chancellor has shown a willingness to uh, introduce new schemes and new measures where gaps in the original provision have emerged. Uh, sole traders, micro businesses, they remain an area where we need the UK government to step in and offer the support that is needed. Adam Price. I'd, uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, testing, uh, First Minister. In England, uh, two mega laboratories uh, that have the capacity to conduct tens of thousands of tests per day are already operational, and a third one is going to be added in England soon. Scotland will have a mega lab by the end of this week, and as set out in the UK government's uh, testing plan, uh, Northern Ireland already has established uh, a major laboratory at the headquarters of Randox Laboratories in County Antrim. So we now are the only nation in these islands that has not seen a large-scale laboratory uh, set up specifically uh, in, uh, in, um, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, did you ask for a mega lab for Wales? Uh, so as we have the testing capacity uh, we need in Wales, so we have no problem in Wales in processing the tests that are being carried out. The, the capacity we have is adequate to deal with the tests we are currently conducting and we have plans to expand that capacity in the right way for Wales. We didn't need to go to anybody else to get advice on their solutions when we have a solution that we are implementing in a way that meets our needs and is right for our circumstances. First Minister, how can you say that we have the necessary capacity when you've missed your own targets on, on tests three times in three weeks and now you, you've, you've scrapped them? Let's talk about uh, the uh, capacity for testing within Wales. It's almost six weeks since scientists at Cardiff University wrote uh, to the Welsh Government offering uh, their expertise in conducting uh, tests uh, here in, in Wales. Almost six weeks later, uh, uh, those hundreds of scientists, and by the way, I spoke to one of them this morning, uh, and uh, their laboratories haven't had the go-ahead, haven't had the accreditation to conduct a single test on a key worker here in Wales. Is it when any wonder that Sir Martin Evans has accused you of a dereliction of duty? Well, I think the member has to be careful not to mix up uh, the different aspects of testing. He originally asked me about laboratories that were dealing with tests that had been carried out. And I repeat to him what I said. Uh, we don't have any current deficit in our ability to process the tests that are being carried out. And we have uh, plans to increase that capacity when we need it. Uh, the rapid review of testing that Paul Davis referred to uh, showed us how we can increase the number of tests available and increase the take up of tests. Uh, and we're putting that review into practice. 
We will have more tests in Wales this week than last. We're increasing the take-up of them, particularly from social care, but from other key workers uh, as well. We have police officers and firefighters being tested uh, now uh, in Wales. Uh, on Sir Martin Evans's comments, I was surprised uh, to see them, and I see that Cardiff University immediately put out a statement saying that his views did not represent the views of the university and that the university continued to work very closely with the Welsh Government on a range of pandemic-related matters. Mark Reckless. Uh, First Minister, may I thank you not just for your statement, but for all the work that you and your team are doing. Uh, I trust that you are you are bearing up well in, in, in these quite extraordinary circumstances. In trying to scrutinise what Welsh Government is doing, it is tempting to concentrate on the areas where the approach in Wales is somewhat different perhaps than that taken by the UK Government. But overall, those differences are relatively small. And I think there's a far greater commonality in approach than there is any difference. There is, however, I think, between the the UK and most countries in in Europe, some difference in terms of how we uh, approach that, that our lockdown, or at least compulsory lockdown measures, came in rather later. And we are seeing, even just looking at hospital deaths, deaths in the, the UK and indeed Wales on a per capita basis as at or towards the the, the top of uh, the European uh, League table, if that's not an appropriate phrase to use, and the difficulties of the data and the comparisons are are very real. I I just wonder, we can see that very very negative side of it, but uh, all the families who are uh, affected by those those losses and and that we commiserate in every possible way with, 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 with them. We see that happening. What is the Welsh government's uh, planning assumption about what that will mean as we gradually, at some point in the future, are able to loosen measures? Does the Welsh government consider that there will be a greater degree of uh, immunity from people who have had the virus, be that asymptomatic or be that with relatively limited symptoms? Uh, There are studies showing uh, suggesting in Stockholm, perhaps uh, around 30% of, of people having had uh, in, infection. Do we have an assumption or any way of measuring or projecting what that will be uh, for Wales and what the impact that will, will, will be uh, when we consider uh, easing measures? Could I also ask about the uh, testing uh, sort of re- 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 regime? Uh, we had some time ago community testing, and, and that was then sort of sh- shut down as we we move from one one stage of the the pandemic to another. We've had these targets of five thousand or perhaps nine thousand at the end of the month for Wales, and a hundred thousand for the UK or, or for England. I, I don't know if those are the right targets, but it, it doesn't look, look as if we're particularly in distance of of hitting them. And I just wonder what can be done to make testing more widespread. I mean, one health board that I'm in good contact with, and it may be a more general issue, at least at the end of last week, uh, didn't want to give wider testing to to, to partners and other organizations because of concerns that they didn't have cover around data protection and GDPR, and they were waiting for Public Health Wales to publish a, or at least share with them a protocol on what should be done. I mean, surely the degree of emphasis that would go to those issues should be less when we have a pandemic of this scale and we have this urgency of having greater testing. And if an organization is sharing data from someone who's had a, a, a test and is sharing a swab to be tested with another organization, a health board that's got the testing capacity, why can't that be tested and the, the test result and the other data returned whence it, 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 it came, given that the person has, has permission for that test. I, I know ideally one would like to give a lot of feedback and ensure what pathways people would go down depending on what that test result is. But surely it is better if people believe they have coronavirus, that it is better that they are tested and find out for sure whether they do or not have that. And I, I just wonder, can 
Welsh Government do anything or, or show a lead in terms of any data protection issues if this still is a, a concern that's slowing or, or making it hard to test people who are not directly employed by the health boards? Uh, can you as First Minister give a, give, give a lead in that area? Uh, so thank uh, Mark Reckless for uh, his opening uh, remarks. Uh, the relationship between Wales and the rest of the United Kingdom in the coronavirus virus crisis uh, is one in which I believe that working alongside the other governments is a strength, uh, that when we can do things together and send a single message out to the public, that that makes that message simpler and therefore more readily uh, heard and understood. But where there are things which we need to do differently to meet Welsh circumstances, then of course we will do that as well. But I always go into the room with other UK governments looking for common ground and trying to craft a way forward in which we can all sign up to it together. Uh, I agree with what uh, Mr. Eckler said about following European uh, evidence, about looking at experience elsewhere. Other European countries are coming out of coronavirus uh, ahead of us, are lifting restrictions before we are able to do so. We need to capture the learning that they will have about what the impact of that uh, will be. Um, on immunity, my understanding uh, of this is that we don't have good enough evidence from anywhere in the world that having coronavirus gives you a level of immunity that means that you can confidently go and provide services to people who have the virus, knowing that you can't be uh, reinfected or that you uh, can't be a source of difficulties to others. Uh, that, there is a huge amount of work going on in many countries to try and uh, establish that evidence. But today, you couldn't confidently say to somebody who'd been tested, who the test demonstrates that they've had uh, the virus, that that now means that they can safely go and put themselves in places uh, that otherwise would be um, a source of risk to them. The pattern for the future that we are anticipating in Wales depends a great deal on the rate of, uh, re of conformity with the current lockdown arrangements. Um, if it was only 40%, the virus could still be rising. If it's 60%, then we can be pretty confident that the virus uh, rate of spread in the community will be going down. If it's 75%, we may well see a very real suppression uh, of the virus that uh, will last into the weeks ahead. So the modelling depends upon the extent to which we can go on persuading people to abide by the restrictions. As you know, in Wales, we've had a fantastic uh, response to that, but we need to make sure that that uh, continues. On testing and on the data sharing issue particularly, um, the Information Commissioner put out uh, guidance very early on that said that his office would look sympathetically on uh, measures that were being taken to make sure that data was properly uh, shared while making it clear that the law has not changed. Uh, and therefore, when organisations are sharing data, and remember, the data belongs to the patient, not to the organisation. So it's your data and my data and the person being tested data that is being shared. But there is still an obligation on organisations to make sure that that is being done in a way which is careful and proportionate. And while I don't want uh, GDPR data sharing issues to get in the way of doing the right thing, I do understand why people who will be held responsible or the way in which they have made those decisions on our data uh, need to make sure that they are doing it in a way that would continue to stand up to scrutiny from the Information Commissioner and any court of law. We are almost out of time for this statement and I haven't been able to call a backbencher uh, yet. So if I can extend the time slightly in order to be able to call uh, backbenchers, we will review uh, this uh, allocation of time and uh, uh, allocation within uh, 
uh, the time for uh, speakers and, and party leaders uh, for, for next week's uh, session um, in order to allow more backbenchers to be called. If I can ask for succinct questions and succinct answers uh, from now on, I'll try and call as many as possible within the next 10 minutes. Mark Isherwood. Yeah, Claire, I thought. In the letter to you on Monday, uh, Autistic UK Cymru said the Wales regulations, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations, have been in a, written in a way that further confuses autistic people. Um, in England, people with specific medical needs, including those with learning disabilities or autism who require specific exercise, may leave their homes to exercise in an open space two or three times a day. And I've been contacted by concerned families across Wales who need the same provision, asking why they can't have it in Wales. In your briefing on Monday, you made positive noises about changes to the regulations, including those for people with learning disabilities or autism. Will you now therefore ensure that individuals with learning disabilities or autism in Wales who require specific exercise uh, can access that uh, in a way equivalent to that to their uh, colleagues across the border? Um, local councils across Wales are facing huge financial pressures uh, as a result of the pandemic, with losses uh, estimated to be in excess of £33 million a month. How will you address the concerns expressed by local authorities in Wales with low levels of reserves that they will go under without financial help to cover the additional costs of providing services during this pandemic? And will you commit to giving the additional £95 million pounds your government will re uh, receive from the UK government in consequence of the £1.6 billion announced for local councils in England to fight COVID-19 directly to local authorities in Wales to support the key services they provide uh, and the independent care sector they support provide in their collective fight against this pandemic. Finally, in, in the virtual plenary two weeks ago, I asked you to clarify um, provision for critical workers to access um, uh, childcare and, and educational settings for their children after having been contacted by NH staff in Fincher who've been told that both parents had to be critical workers in order to qualify. I understand that in most councils the rule has been um, um, the same in that where possible in such circumstances a parent should stay at home and look after the child but where that's not possible care has been made available. Um, my colleague Susie Davis learned from the Education Minister last Friday, we understand that all that now needs to be shown is that one parent is a key worker. Could you therefore please clarify and give clear instruction to or direction to local authorities whether that's accurate and whether it is now sufficient for one parent to be a key worker um, where the other parent is not able to be at home for any part of the day or the week? Uh, so with, uh, thank you. We're obliged to review the regulations every 21 days. As a result of our first review, we intend to change the guidance on exercise for families where there is a medical need to have exercise uh, more than once a day that will encompass children uh, with autism. We will amend the regulations at the end uh, of this week in the way that Mr. Uh, Isherwood uh, referred to. As far as local councils are concerned, we've already given them £110 million pounds, uh, more in Wales, well exceeding the £95 million pounds consequential. But of course, we are alert to the continuing pressures that local authorities face on their budgets and are in discussions with the WLGA about that additional £95 million, pounds, and there will be further assistance for local authorities in Wales. Uh, I believe the guidance has already clarified the position of critical care workers and childcare, uh, but I will make sure that if there is any ambiguity left in the minds of some local authorities, uh, that we clarify that with them. John Griffiths. Yes, um, First Minister, you made mention of um, the restrictions um, on movement and leaving home, and I think um, everybody understands the importance of discipline and compliance, um, as you mentioned and that you will be guided by the medical and scientific advice in terms of any easing of those restrictions. Um, I wonder if there's any more you can say at this stage um, in terms of what um, early easing of restrictions might look like in Wales, um, because I think a lot of people are obviously very interested in that. 
and the restrictions themselves have an impact on physical and mental health um, and well-being. So I'm, we're all really pleased that people are observing these restrictions and that's so important to protect public health and frontline staff. But I think people are very interested in what might happen uh, a little way down the track in terms of early easing when scientific and medical advice supports that. Uh, well, thanks uh, to John for that, Llywydd. Look, I'm, I'm not going today to give actual examples of what early moves in easing the restrictions might be. What I want people in Wales to know is that we are developing a set of tests that we will apply to any particular measure. Uh, the first and foremost test being what would the impact of carrying out that course of action be on public health? But we will ask questions such as how could that measure be policed? If you're going to change the rules, can the rules be enforced? Uh, and um, how easily could that be reversed if it turned out to be having an adverse impact? If that was something that caused the virus to spread again, uh, would we be able to reverse it quickly as well? Uh, whatever measures we introduce, I think there will be a need for a clear set of protocols around that activity because while I know as John said lots of people are looking forward to the day when some of the restrictions can be eased I think there will be a lot of people fearful about stepping back uh, into ordinary life uh, we have had weeks in which we are all abiding by the message stay home help protect the NHS save lives and as people move beyond that I think people are going to need confidence of knowing but there are a set of rules around any activity which mean that their health is, and welfare is being safeguarded. So as we identify the particular measures against the tests, so we will want to work with those sectors to make sure that those protocols and rules are in place to give people the confidence to take up those activities again. Because without them, I think people may be nervous about taking those first uh, steps without knowing that we are really thinking that through and making sure that their health and well-being is being properly safeguarded. John Bowden. Flowers, and uh, thank you for your statement, uh, First Minister. And can I add my thanks to those of others for you and your uh, ministers in terms of everything that you're doing at the moment? Really, really difficult times for all of all of us. Um, two issues from me. Uh, firstly, uh, I know that we we, we all recognise the remarkable voluntary efforts that we're seeing across our communities to help the vulnerable neighbours and friends. So, could you please update us on uh, Welsh government's support for the third sector to help underpin the contribution of volunteers uh, and, and secondly kind of following up from from what John Griffiths was saying really but you've you've already said that the next phase of our response must be led by the scientific advice so can I ask whether your current evaluation of that advice and the possibility that we might have to manage the impact of the virus on our communities, possibly for another 12 to 18 months. Does that mean that investment in testing stations, PPE and other equipment, in rapid response teams for future outbreaks and in maintaining community and volunteering networks, in reality is gonna continue for the foreseeable future and until we have an effective vaccination programme? Uh, well, thank uh, John Bowden for those questions. So on the voluntary effort, we have 15,000 new volunteers uh, in the system as a result of the coronavirus appeals. That's more than double the number of volunteers that were previously registered uh, in that system. And that's a fantastic uh, response. Uh, and here in Wales, the help that we are able to offer that group of people who are not in the shielded category, but nevertheless have real vulnerability because they don't have family or friends or neighbours or other networks they can use. The mobilisation of that voluntary effort through community voluntary councils working with local authorities, I think has been an astonishing strength of the way that we've been able to make sure that those vulnerable people in Wales have not been neglected, not just set to uh, one side. And that is an effort that is going to have to continue uh, for many uh, weeks and months ahead, because uh, I want to take uh, up Dawn's second point, Chloe, and just uh, underline it. 
this is a long haul. This is not going to be over uh, quickly. Until there is a vaccination that everybody can feel confident works, then we're going to be living with outbreaks of this virus for quite a long time to come. And as we lift the lockdown, so the surveillance measures in the community, our ability to be able to spot quickly and respond quickly to local flaring up of the virus again, will be an absolutely essential part of the plan that John Griffiths asked me about. And our chief medical officer has already developed a surveillance plan uh, for Wales that we will need as the lockdown begins to be uh, eased. And we are discussing with Public Health Wales uh, this week how that plan can be translated into services on the ground. It will mean a different sort of testing regime, going back to community testing rather than testing aimed solely at patients and at staff. It will be a huge effort that we will need to mobilise uh, again. And that's why in my opening statement, I emphasised our determination to use the time we have during the next three weeks to put those sort of plans firmly in place. Sean Gwenllian. Um, heddiw yma, ma pymthag o loctoriaid sy'n arwain clysterau iechyd ar draws Cymru wedi anfon llythyr cadarn at y chi yn gofyn am gyfyngiadau llawer llymach ar gyfer ail gartrefi. Fydd eich llywodraeth chi yn gwrando ar lais y clinigwyr yma sy'n galw am wachar y defnydd o ail gartrefi yng Nghymru er mwyn atal ail don o'r haint. Mae'n sopor meddwl am ail don ar ôl wthnosa o bwysa parhaol ar staff rhenglaen, ond rhaid i ni wynebu'r posibelrwydd real yna um, a gwrdd gynllunio ar gyfer hynny, mae rhaid rhaid sicrwydd un hardaloedd gwledig, un hardaloedd twristaidd ni y bydd i anghenio nhw yn flinllaw yn y cynllunio yma. Ac ydych chi'n cysyn efo fi hefyd bod rhaid dirwy o 65 i rai sydd yn teithio yma'n ddi angen. Wel, dos am ond un gair amdano fo, bod hynny'n chwerthynllyd o fach. A gaw, nowch chi gefnogi galwad Plaid Cymru am feddwriaeth i gynyddu y ddirwy i fil o bina, fel bod yr heddlu yn gallu rhoi cosb go iawn i rai sydd yn torri'r priola ac yn teithio yma yn ddi angen. Uh, well, uh, diolch i Sian, gwenllu yna, Cristina. Dwi ddim wedi weld y llythyr yna a uh, eto ond wrth cwrs dwi'n cyd nabod uh, y pethau mae hi uh, wedi ddweud. Ni wedi gweithio'n galed gyda'r, uh, gyda'r heddlu uh, ledled Cymru a maen nhw wedi defnyddio y pwerau sydd da nhw ar hyn o bryd. Bob penwthnos uh, maen nhw'n wneud pethau, uh, maen nhw'n dod ar draws bobl sydd yn teithio i fewn uh, i'r Gymru a maen nhw'n troi nhw'n o. Uh, maen nhw wedi wneud na tro ar ôl tro. A bob wythnos dwi'n ofyn i'r arheddlu ydy'r pwerau sydd dan nhw ar hyn o bryd yn digono neu ydy nhw'n eisiau ni wneud uh, fwy. A, a casgliad ni'n dod at i dwi'n meddwl yw, uh, ni'n eisiau tynnu'r heddlu uh, Llywodraeth Cymru a bobl uh, yn y maes dagilydd just i weld. Uh, mae un peth yn ddweud i cryfhau y mesurau, mae rhywbeth arall i cynllunio y mesurau iddyn nhw'n wneud y uh, iddyn nhw delio gyda'r uh, unrhyw problemau mae'r heddlu yn gallu uh, dangos ato ni. A ni'n dwi eisiau wneud y gwaith yna, a os mae rhywbeth arall ni'n gallu wneud, ble mae'r heddlu yn dweud bydd hwnna'n defnyddio, iddyn nhw dwi'n hollol fodlon i mynd lawr y llwybr uh, yna. A dwi ddim yn gytuno, uh, da siân gwen uh, llian uh, am uh, ar arian. Ni'n uh, gallu tynnu mas o bobl sydd ddim yn gyd yn ffurio gyda'r uh, reolau. Um, Dyn ni ddim yn just yn gallu wneud hwnna am un ffordd o paidio ac i ddim ffurio. Um, ac i, I fi, dwi ddim wedi tyst, weld tystiolaeth o gwbl uh, sy'n ddweud. Mae'r lefelau ni'n sydd da ni yma yn Cymru ddim anifeithiol, a dwi ddim wedi weld, dwi ddim yn meddwl mae'r achos wedi cael ei wneud i newid beth uh, sy'n da ni yn y maes yna. Alan Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very grateful to the First Minister for his statement and for his openness in answering uh, these questions. 
I'd like to return to the subject of procurement, if that's possible. We saw yesterday the, the absolute chaos of a permanent secretary um, at the Foreign Office being forced to write to a, a House of Commons Select Committee to retract evidence that he'd given yesterday afternoon to that same committee on the issue of EU procurement of ventilators. We saw last night reports on uh, the BBC on Newsnight that the privatisation of the health service in, uh, in England had led to real issues and problems with the procurement of um, uh, PPE. So I'd like to ask the First Minister to, to what extent and whether he believes the chaos that we're seeing across the border in England is having a detrimental effect on the ability of the Welsh Government to procure both the equipment needed for hospitals and the personal protection, protection equipment needed for our frontline staff to deliver care for people and whether the problems being faced by the UK government in England are causing him difficulties in ensuring that we're able to provide for uh, people and staff working on the front line in Wales. Uh, well, sorry, I want to distinguish between two things. On the one hand, we are working very closely with colleagues right across uh, the United Kingdom on procurement, procuring as a UK is to our advantage because of the extra uh, strength that gives you in the market. Uh, and we're working on mutual aid as well. We have recently provided mutual aid to Northern Ireland uh, in a supply of um, goods that they were about to run out of. And we've had help from Scotland uh, to strengthen our stocks in areas where we were uh, running low. So uh, I'm still completely committed to that way of doing things. Uh, the contrast I would make, however, uh, is one that Alan Davis points to. Here in Wales, we still have a national health service, uh, a system that is planned, a system that is uh, easy enough uh, for people to be able to operate where common rules happen in all places. The struggle that our colleagues in England face is an atomized uh, service, uh, where people have been encouraged to compete with one another uh, rather than to collaborate with one another. And just at the point when collaboration and working together has to be the way through, they are having to battle the system they now have and the culture that they have created in the way that we simply don't have to here in Wales. Leanne Wood. Um, First Minister, some arrests have been made in connection with the deliberate setting of uh, mountain fires in the Rhonda on Monday evening. People locally are very angry as these fires pose a risk to life. We've got mountain rangers and I'm sure that people will support those uh, with encouragement. Can you facilitate community involvement in mountain fire prevention? If you don't, I'm concerned that people may take matters into their own hands, such as the level of anger. Can you also tell us what can be done from a government perspective in terms of messaging to educate people about the seriousness of setting grass fires, particularly uh, in the time that we're in now? I wanted to ask about supermarkets as well and the specialised slots. Um, after the delay, supermarkets now have finally received the information from your government about customers in the shielding group so that they can be prioritised for home delivery. So why are so many people still unable to get those priority slots? Some supermarkets tell me that they are meeting demand, but I'm still hearing complaints from people with legitimate reasons to have a home delivery that they are still unable to secure one. So you've mentioned that we're in this for the long haul. How can you, as a government, increase the capacity of the home delivery service? And finally, I wanted to just ask you about uh, key workers. I wrote to your government earlier today to call for the extension of free public transport uh, that is offered to NHS workers to cover all key workers that are keeping society running in these dangerous conditions. Will you actively consider this offer to um, recognise the contribution of all key workers? And further to this, would the government be prepared to consider meeting the funeral costs of key workers if they've died as a result of contracting COVID-19 uh, as part of their work? As you are aware, funerals can cost in excess of £5,000. These people have died carrying out a public duty 
I think it's the least that they deserve. Uh, so thanks to Leanne Wood for those questions. I entirely share uh, her concerns about uh, grass fires. Uh, we work very hard with the fire and rescue service. I'll make sure that we convey to them the point that she makes about community uh, involvement, because that's a service we would have to rely on uh, to carry that out. But at a time when we need the fire and rescue service to be assisting our ambulance uh, service with everything that they are uh, assisting us with in the coronavirus crisis, it is just completely wrong that people are having to deal with events that need never have happened. Uh, you know, we've said in the past, you know, uh, it's often been said it's young people, it's children who do these things. There is evidence that it's adults who are causing uh, these grass fires. People who really ought to know better. Uh, and frankly, I'm for uh, that point about community involvement and we'll make sure that the fire and rescue service uh, get that message. Uh, on supermarkets, let me just be clear, there was no delay in getting supermarkets the information. There was a considerable delay in some supermarkets taking down off their websites uh, the notice that said they were waiting for the information. They'd had the information for several days, many days in some cases, before they managed to take that notice down. Uh, they've had that information from us. But again, to be clear, it is people in the shielded group. It's not that wider group of people who have other vulnerabilities uh, who are being prioritized through the agreement that we have with the supermarkets. And that's exactly the same in every other part of the United Kingdom. So all the supermarkets have the data uh, of who are on the shielded uh, group, where people are being added to the shielded group as they are because of general practitioners are uh, adding names, the supermarkets are getting that additional information uh, as well. Uh, Leslie Griffiths meets the supermarkets uh, on a weekly basis. They too want to extend the number of slots they have uh, available, but increasing their capacity is something that just can't be turned on uh, overnight. Where there are people who cannot get um, a home delivery via the supermarkets, and where they have a real need because they can't rely on anybody else to do it for them. That's where local authorities have been stepping in with the volunteers that we referred to uh, earlier. And where any assembly member has uh, a, an individual or a family not able to access the, uh, sh the shielded slots for supermarkets, but still in need of assistance. It's to the hubs that local authorities have created that we should go. Uh, and we've got real evidence of them being able to mobilize help where it is needed. Uh, and as for key uh, workers, I think Leanne said that she'd written uh, today, so I will uh, look out for her letter and then uh, respond when I've had a chance to uh, consider what she has uh, said in it.